Okay. 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 Recording. I got it. Sorry. Okay. So, and, and yeah, I've got a few flies that I'm going to share with you tonight. These are, these are patterns that, um, that I used uh, quite a bit, um, especially last season up on the lakes while I was guiding and fishing. Um, and uh, each one, you know, shares a unique story that I'm going to tell as I, as I get ready to tie the fly. So I'm going to start by um, introducing Thank you, you to a very old book out of my library. Um, this was first published in 1990. It's a uh, Gary LaFontaine classic called The Dry Fly. I think it was one of his uh, second or third books. Um, he came out with a, a, a masterpiece called Caddis Flies before this one. Um, but I, I, I first purchased this book in 1990, um, I believe uh, the first year that I worked here at the Fly Fisher's Place before I even owned the store. And there was a couple of flies in here that, that kind of immediately caught my attention. And one of those flies was called the Halo Emerger. And way back in, in 1990, I started tying the Halo Emerger in size 18 and 20 in a blueing olive color and size 16 primarily for pale morning duns in a yellow color. And they worked very well, uh, different places like the Metolius, which is you know, known to be a, a technical and tough trout fishery. Um, the caught fish with them there and caught fish with them at the Fall River. And then, you know, years went by and I kind of stopped tying the fly and, and sort of forgot about it. And there's this story that kept circulating around in the, in the lake fishing world um, about how terrestrials end up in, in lakes. Um, and the story originated from Gary LaFontaine's book um, called Fly Fishing the Mountain Lakes, which has been out of print for some time. Let's see when it was uh, published here. Seems like it would have been mid 90s, but let me double check that. Um, 1998, so later 90s. And I finally got a copy of that um, last winter and read it and um, yeah, and it could be mainly because I was very interested in, in, the, in the terrestrial story and how all these ants and beetles are ending up on our lakes and, and why they're such an uh, important food source. And it, in that reading of the book, it, it, I kind of rediscovered a couple of uh, very unique flies that came out of the dry fly book, one being the halo emerger and the other one being the shroud. And so <clears throat> I was inspired one winter night of, uh, you know, early 2020 or late 2019 while reading the book and, and tied some of each and put them in my Calabatus box. Um, and uh, especially when I was guiding, had, had some of my clients trying them out, you know, they're the guinea pigs and turned out they worked really well, um, especially uh, very consistently the, uh, the halo emerger. So that's the fly that we're going to start with. Um, when we get to the shroud, I'll tell you a little bit more about that one. And then finally, we're going to tie an adaptation of a, a simple parachute fly that, uh, that we call Jeff's Black Butte Calabatus here at the shop. Um, so we're going to start. I don't know how many people are tying along, but I'm going to start with this first fly. So I'm going to change cameras here. Do -do -do. Zoom in. So I'm going to start by... Um, Using this hook, it is um, a, uh, a Tiemco. Um, it's uh, actually, excuse me, it's an Umqua Feather Merchants uh, 004BN, and it's kind of it's kind of a cool little straight eye emerger hook. You can use this uh, hook, you know, 12, 14, 16. I'm tying this one in a 14 right now. So I'll put that in the vise. Black tying thread is uh, recommended for this, so I'll we'll start a little. Whoops. Start a little base of thread on the hook. Coming back up to the eye, trim the excess. Now, first material, just a nice uh, chunk of uh, like comparadon deer. Now, interestingly enough, the original fly from Gary's book suggests using a orange uh, deer hair on it for more visibility. And while I've tried that some, um, I really prefer the more natural look um, of using just a, a natural deer hair. I, I find that even on the lakes casting this out, you know, 
30, 40 feet from the boat or the, or the tube, um, however you're accessing the lake, that you know, this still shows up really well in, in a lot of lake conditions and water conditions. So I'm, I'm using natural deer hair, but um, you know, do keep in mind that you could use a bright deer hair. Uh, I will also mention that last, last year, just reach behind me, last year I tied some of them using um, red uh, foam cylinder for the, for the wing. And it was kind of a strike indicator top. And on some rough days, uh, when, when there was a lot of, a lot of wind chop, uh, we were using those foam flies for extra flotation, but also extra visibility. And, and that worked too. Although I would say not as well as the deer hair fly. So I'm going to trim out a little bit of deer hair off of my hide. And we'll take that small clump and we're going to get rid of the, um, the fuzz out of the bottom. So we're take that out. Getting rid of the under fur. One great way to get rid of under fur, once you get most of it picked out this way, is take it from the tips and blow right down the backside of it into the butts. And then a lot of that, a lot of that fuzz will come out from the tips. Okay. And then that that really cleans it out. So you get a lot less bulky tie in when you're tying in that deer hair. Now I still feel like this is maybe a little bit too much of a clump. So I'm, I'm just going to get, just take out a little bit more of that. Just clean it just a little bit more, kind of peek at it a little bit. Now, <clears throat> some of you are going to be really perfectionist uh, tires and some of you are not, not going to care um, and just want to tie a lot of them quick. Um, Gary, uh, the originator of the fly, LaFontaine, didn't stack this hair. Uh, he tied it in unstacked. Um, you could stack it now if you wanted to, just put it in a, in a hair stacker and stack it. But in the tradition of, uh, of Mr. LaFontaine, I'm not going to. I'm going to measure that for length up against my hook shank just to make sure it's not too long. And then behind the eye of the hook, giving myself a little room behind the eye of the hook, I'm going to tie that in at the top. and trim the excess tightly and then cover those butts with my tying thread. Okay, now one thing that you probably saw or heard a million reminders of from last week when John Kreft taught the class and Sherry's uh, Sunday email to everybody was that we're using a foam that's commonly found in packing material. In fact, this is called packing foam. And it's a closed cell, about one millimeter, one and a half millimeter thick foam that um, in the water uh, collects a lot of light around it and gets a, an aura of light that comes around this particular foam. You know, there's lots of, there's lots of fly tying foams out there. Like for instance, I'll just grab this off of the wall. This, you know, this white uh, thin fly, two millimeter foam that, you know, you could use, but you're not getting the, the halo effect that Gary had intended when he tied this fly originally. And that's why this foam is so special for this particular fly. I've been using this foam for a lot more flies lately than, than just this uh, particular pattern. In fact, um, I recently uh, figured out a very cool water boatman pattern that I use this foam with and then color it with marking pins. Um, and you can tie it either with a bead head or without, so it, it can be a floating boatman or a sinking boatman. And it, it's, it's dynamite translucency in the water. So this foam, if you can find a, a pretty big piece, you should covet it. It's, it's very cool. So <clears throat> what you're going to do is you're going to cut off a little strip off of there. Okay. And you're going to come in behind the, uh, behind the deer hair wing and you're going to tie, tie that in with a few wraps going one way, kind of bend the, uh, bend the foam just a little bit and then figure eight around the foam here, tying this in kind of spent wing style, okay? So I'll, I'll rotate the vise just a little bit so you can see that from the top and from the bottom, all right? And these are gonna get trimmed down to just little nubbins towards the end of the fly, but for now, We'll leave, them, we'll leave them like that so they'll, they'll be easy to work around as we're dubbing through them 
All right. Next thing we're going to do, come back to the bend of the hook and tie in the tail. And I'm, I'm using uh, some nature spirit uh, olive marabou. And the, the reason that I'm using olive, oh, excuse me, forgetting a step, the very, very important part of this fly. Um, white antron yarn could be from a spool or could be uh, uh, carded, either one, doesn't make any difference. I'm gonna get a little clip of that. We're gonna clean, clean out the long pieces here that were left over. And then what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna split this because uh, a whole piece is just gonna be too much bulk. So I'm gonna split it. I can put this on my desk and use it for a, another fly. This one, I'm gonna kind of clean up a little bit, twisting it to get it back into shape so that all the fibers kind of come back together. And then I'm going to trim it, give it a perfect little haircut so that when it goes onto the end of the fly, it's not going to leave any sort of a mess. And what I'm going to do now, Jeff, I got a question for you on the shuck. Yep. What colors predominantly work as a, a good shuck material? Well, on Calabetus, the answer would be kind of a, an olive color or sort of a tannish gray color. Because if you look at most Calabetus simps, that's the, that's the color that they are. So I would say on, uh, last year, I only tied this fly in this color combination. And it, it was great on, on every lake that I used it on. So olive or gray, olive brown or gray. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I uh, got this white antron yarn tying that in, coming down the bend of the hook just a little bit with it, um, and then wrapping that up the shank about two or three turns, tying that in. Gary's original fly tied that in very very loosely. Um, I. I personally uh, like it a little tighter, so I tie, I tie it in a little tighter. But you can see that uh, pretty carefully now. Uh, if you look closely right here, you've got your, your white antron butt. I'm gonna move those wings out of the way so you can really see that uh, where, where it is in relation to the, the hook uh, bend and, uh, and where I'm gonna tie in the tail, all right? Next up, I'm gonna grab a little bit of olive marabou. And you might've looked at my directions that I sent out, uh, kind of the step-by-step -step directions that you would've got in the email on Sunday or Saturday, whenever that went out. Um, but I'm gonna take this and trim off the, the butts. And you can see that it's extremely long right now, but no worries. We're gonna tie that in just in front of where that uh, white um, tag is. And then I'm gonna just take my, my fingernail and trim that, okay? So when that gets wet and tapers down, um, it just it just looks like a little nymphal shuck just kind of as the adult is trying to crawl out of that nymphal shuck and it, it looks it's super wavy in the water and looks just like the nymph there and that and that white tag that kind of gets enveloped within the the marabou um, creates this aura of light too that the shuck is becoming empty. All right, this is. Um, this is a really great uh, uh, brand of dubbing uh, Nature Spirit. I'm gonna be using it for all of my flies tonight. Um, and I've got a whole bunch of different colors. This is their emergence dubbing. Um, and I, I, just, I just recently went through uh, my dubbing drawer and, and started organizing them into these sort of things and labeling them because I just had these bags full. I mean, I had them organized as to what type of dubbing they were, but it was just hard to find stuff. So this makes it a lot easier to find the, the type of dubbing and the color that I'm looking for a lot quicker. So I know that, that this is my Calabatus uh, color of, of uh, emergence dubbing. I'm just gonna get a little bit of that out, okay? That's gonna be way more than I'm gonna need for this fly, but we're gonna dub a little body on here onto the thread, okay? just a little bit at a time. 
just like your your first grade teacher used to say a dabble do you they were talking about glue i'm talking about dubbing okay we just double a little noodle on there i like to just kind of scooch that up closer to where the tail is going to be to avoid more thread wraps make sure that first wrap of of dubbing comes up right up against the the tail and then just kind of loosely dub up to the wing and then come around the wing i am actually going to need just a little bit more i was wrong hate that Okay, a couple of wraps in front of the wing. And then, and then I'm going to take the deer hair wing and get that up out of the way so I can get my thread to come underneath it. One little deer hair piece in there. We'll trim that later. And that helps, that helps get that wing up a little bit. Sort of, you know, a lot of emergers have that that wing in that position. And there's a reason for that in that it, it helps cast a, a shadow of um, the mayfly emergence over the surface of the water in a way that, that creates a shadow. So that when the, when, the, when the bug is laying on the water, it, when it's actually coming out of the nimshuk, it's, it's usually not laying down like this. It's, it's pushing its way up and there's a, there's a little bit of a, a shadow underneath it and the fish recognize that sort of thing. So there's been a lot of great emergers over the year that have their their wings cocked at that angle and this is another one that recognizes that uh, trait. Okay now we're going to just trim these little wing pads on the side. Very very short. And that is your halo emerger. All right. So that's our number one fly tonight. Um, Jeff, excuse oh. me. Would you add any um, floating to any part of that fly or just use the foam to let it? Stay? Yeah, no, great, great question. Yep, I absolutely add uh, floating to this fly. Um, and uh, I, I kind of, Kind of go back and forth um, sometimes on what kind of floatants I, I prefer. Um, you know, I'm definitely a big powder guy, particularly for, um, you know, the Shimazaki dry shake or the loon dry dust are two of my favorites. Um, I, t I typically use the loon uh, product uh, out in the boat, um, have two or three of them in the, in the, uh, the, the tackle bag or the tackle box as it, as it may be. Um, and, um, I, I oftentimes will just start by, you know, taking the fly out of the box, tying it onto the tippet and putting it on the powder and, and shaking it up. That being said, um, I think there's a, there's a lot to be uh, gained by putting a little coating of um, loon aquel on the fly first um, and fishing it just with the aquel and then maintaining it with the Shimazaki or the loon powder. Uh, once it's once it's uh, caught a fish or soaked up water and isn't floating well anymore, experiment on your own and see. I go back and forth. Um, uh, for a long time, I never used any liquid floatant, and um, uh, and then a couple of years ago, when Tom Jarman came out from Australia, uh, he's a, a fly fishing team member in Australia, one of the top 25 in the last four or five World Championships, um, wins a lot of competitions in the Commonwealth countries. Um, he got me really excited about about aquel again and I, I found that it really floats the fly incredibly well so oh, i think it's a great question i i do go back and forth but i think starting with a, a base of aquel is probably a good idea with this fly and then maintaining it with a um, you know amadou patch and a or a dry fly towel and then and then some powder and then go in and catch another fish so um it's a durable fly floats really well it's a it's a pattern that i guarantee you a lot of the fish in central oregon 
have never seen. Um, that's another thing, you know, I think fish get kind of used to our patterns and they've never seen this one. And it's a profile that um, it's a real fish fooler. So pretty cool. All right, should we move on to the next one? Anybody have any other questions? I don't, nope. I don't see any of them on the chat, so. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. We got well, 56 joining us tonight. Holy Moses. Holy Welcome moly. everybody, all 56. <laughs> yeah. So the next fly, I'm gonna just zoom in here for a moment. And uh, this next fly is weird, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and and I, I would have never, I mean, I remember seeing this when I first first read the, the dry fly book um, and, then, and then was reintroduced uh, to it last year when I read uh, his book on fly fishing the mountain lakes and, and I was like, are you kidding me? Really, really, you, you, that, that works? Why would it work? And, and he really explained it so nicely in this, in this book, Fly Fishing the Mountain Lakes. And I was like, okay, I'll tie four of them and tuck them in the box for, for uh, the 2020 season. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, I caught fish with it at East Lake um, and caught a lot of fish with it at Hosmer Lake. So I just think it's a very interesting pattern um, that it, to me, I don't know how in the world that could look like um, a calabatus uh, of any shape or form, um, but during a calabatus emergence, uh, it worked. And the other thing about it was, is that he recommended um, in, when he was writing the book that he recommended uh, taking it um, and, uh, and skittering the fly a bit so that you could actually impart some some motion to it and really get those tails to wave around. And I, I tried that and it seemed to work well, but it also seemed to work well just, you know, kind of resting in a light wind chop and just letting the, the wind do the work on the, on the tail. Um, the fish seemed to like it that way too. Did it work every time I went and used it last year? It didn't, um, but it had enough great, you know, positive days that I think I'll tie another half a dozen for the box for this, this coming season. So. Um, I'm going to do the next two flies on a um, Tiemco uh, a 10, uh, is it a 102Y? Yeah, 102Y. It's a black uh, hook that comes in odd sizes. So we sell it in um, 11, 13, 15, 17, and 19 sizes. And I will tell you that the 15 and the 17 just happens to be one heck of a good match for calabatus size, real actual calabatus uh, sizes. Um, in fact, I would even venture to say that in the second brood in the summertime, particularly for the East Lake uh, calabatus that come off in, in August and September, uh, that that 17 hook will outfish a 16 or an 18 hook uh, for sure. It just wow. seems to be just the right sweet spot for the millimeter size of the of what in the heck those uh, actual uh, bugs are coming out as, so just a little weird tidbit of information that comes from time on the water and does it always work or will it work for you? I don't know, but um, it has worked well well for for me and my people that I get to take out in the in the boat. All right, so hooks in the vise. Um, was using this bobbin. Such a simple, simple, simple fly. Um, going to take about two seconds to tie it. So we're going to start with a little bit of red marabou. Uh, this is uh, uh, fish hunter uh, marabou, which is now distributed by Nature Spirit. Um, Jack Moore uh, used to own fish hunter up in Kent, Washington. Uh, he was the uh, stepfather of uh, Randall and Lance Kaufman, quite a fisherman, quite a great lake fisherman, um, and uh, was always known to kind of distribute some of the best marabou in the business. Um, and so when he uh, sold the business and subsequently passed away or passed away and his family sold the business, it was neat to see that um, Joel and, and now Thomas at Nature Spirit kind of took that over and, uh, and kept his his mar marabou supply and his colors uh, that I think were so perfect. So nature spirit and, and, um, and fish hunter marabou are, are actually separately packaged. And I think they're kind of different uh, textures of marabou, 
Um, both have their own uses, but they're both great marabous. So I've got this um, red marabou tail that I'm going to prepare to tie in here at the butt of the fly. Okay, and I'm going to tie this in pretty long. It's going to be about three or four times the length of the hook shank. Turn this off. I've got my uh, nature spirit uh, fine and uh, what, what do they call it? Nature spirit, jeez, uh, my memory. Fine and natural dubbing. I wanted to call it fine and drive. I knew it was fine and something. Fine and natural. Um, this is this is actually uh, this product originated at the Pendleton Woolen Mills. Um, the uh, it, a couple of guys, uh, Terry Ball and Renee Harrop, uh, both great uh, dry fly fishermen, originated this product for um, for the House of Harrop, um, and then Terry started selling it under the under the brand uh, Nature Spirit, and then he sold the he sold the company to. Uh, Joel Weimer and Joel used to be the original owner of the fly box and bend back in the late 70s and, and 80s until he sold it to the Helms who I started working for but um, uh, great great product it's 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 a natural wool um, they got this uh, they got the old um, wool uh, just the kind of the leftover scraps and and uh, turned it into dubbing and then dyed it all these great colors um, and it's one of the best dry fly dubbings around. It was also impregnated with CDC oils to help it float and, and remain waterproof. So it's very, very neat. Uh, one of my favorite dry fly dubbings. Is there, is there, are there finer dry fly dubbings? There are indeed finer dry fly dubbing, but if you dub this carefully, you can tie some really teeny flies with this stuff. So again, this is the Calabatus color. Um, uh, other colors that would be really, really great for Calabatus, um, not in this box here, but in this, in this box here, um, light gray, um, muskrat gray, and uh, gray olive. Um, those are all colors, and light Cahill, actually. How many times have you picked up a Calabatus up at East Lake? And and how to you know land in your boat or on your sleeve and you turn you know grab them by the wings and turn them over and and looked at it and saw how light some of them are under on the underbelly. Um, in fact, I have a, 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 a lot of you guys are up there all the time and I see you and and we see each other and it's really fantastic. It's part of the wonderful camaraderie of the fishing scene in Central Oregon. I dig it. Um, you guys have probably seen the guys up there. Their brothers. They're in an old Alaskan guideboat that says Kulik River Lodge on the side. Um, those fellas are super good fishermen, but not very technical fly guys. And they fish mostly light Cahills and small Adams when the hatch is on. And uh, they catch about as many fish as anybody up there. So that, that light Cahill color um, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be missed. And this, this is getting close. I mean, this is a little bit more tan, this, this Calabatus dye that they're using, but that, that light Cahill color would be another good one to add to the box. All right, so we're going to dub this baby. Little noodle, just little, little bits at a time, right? That's, that's, uh, that's probably even too much, but I'm going to squeeze it tight, put it on there. See you, Brad. Brad's closing up the shop, you guys. Make sure you come out and see them and say hi one of these days. Brad, are you going to lock me in? Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. Bringing that dubbing noodle so that the first wrap comes right up against the marabou tail. And we'll just kind of carefully wrap that forward, keeping a nice even taper. Oops, don't like that wrap right there. I'm going to just tighten that dubbing up just a little bit. Nice even taper coming up You're behind the eye of the hook. Now we're going to grab a hackle. This hackle can be a little bit oversized. It's not 100% necessary. I'm tying on a size 15 hook. So um, 
you can you can go up a little bit you know I, this is about a size 14 hackle on here i suppose i didn't i didn't bring my uh hackle gauge that has the thing but i'll just double check it here on the on my tacket Yeah, it's a little, it's a little big, but it'll be, it'll be great. It'll be great because it, you know, this fly again with a bigger hackle is going to get tilted up a little bit more. It's going to look like something trying to take off, and and those tails are going to even get more of a chance if the hook is is uh, is up to get in the current and wave a bit. Okay. Just kind of wrap this hackle through the thorax area. I guess I probably got about eight turns in there. Let's finish. Trim. Okay, we don't have to do any like pinky swear promises, but I mean, if anybody wanted to pinky swear promise that they'd put like three or four of these in their box for the 21 season and then tell me how they do by, um, you know, midsummer, um, I, I would sure like to hear that some of you guys are, are using the fly and, and finding success with it like I did in, uh, in 2020. Um, and if you haven't read those books, man, um, both are out of print, but uh, I'm a huge fan of, of Mr. LaFontaine. He passed away several years ago from ALS, uh, which is a tragedy uh, because um, he was maybe one of the greatest innovators of our time um, for, fly, for fly fishing, not, not just with flies, but how he approached looking at how trout viewed flies and how they how they appreciated our patterns or not um you know he came up with a lot of great patterns that um buck the norm in so many cases and so gary lafontaine remains one of my all-time favorite fly tires um and do i like every one of his flies or would i fish every one of the flies no but there are some that that i definitely really love um and uh and these are two of them so try them out next season well there is a question uh jeff Okay. Uh, is this hook the same as the first fly? No, no. This hook is different. So I just tie, I'm tying these last two flies on a Tiemco 102Y in either a size 15 or size 17. Um, and the first hook was tied on an emerger hook uh, from Umqua called a 004BN. Um, you could tie it on the same dry fly hook, but I really like that um, that little shorter shank and that. Um, yeah, almost a little bit of a scud bin towards the back of it. It's it's very straight through the through the main shank, but then it, it really curves around, has a nice wide gap. I think Ron Geyer maybe asked that question. And the reason that I like that is because when you wrap that Antron tag around it, um, it, it where that is associated with the bend of the hook is kind of a perfect, perfect place for that bend. And then you've also got a really nice wide gap on that particular hook, um, which you know just just gets them and makes it stick. Uh, fish are, are very easy to land because it it really sticks into their lips great with that wider gap hook. So I'm a I'm a giant fan of that for a lot of emergers. And also I use that hook for a lot of my beetles that I tie when I'm tying foam beetles. I I use that um, U004BN for for beetles, for calabatus emergers. Um, I use it for iris caddis uh, and comparidons when I'm uh, tying for the river. So um, try it, it's a neat hook. So uh, Jeff Allen Cottle uh, asked, what's the name of the fly? I think it was uh, on the handout though. Yeah, both of those, uh, all three flies are, are named in the handout, but the first fly we tied was called the halo emerger. And the second fly we tied was called the shroud. I think that's, uh, yeah, looks like Ron Geyer just bought that book on Amazon. 
<laughs> Very good. <laughs> nice. That's where I got mine too. As a matter of fact, I, I bought the the dry fly, but uh, the dry fly here at the fly fisher's place. Uh, but uh, but the fly fishing the mountain lakes was no longer available um, anywhere. So I bought that on Amazon as well. And um, I think I paid nine ninety five for my copy. So oh, I got a good, good bargain on it. Um, okay. So. Um, Cool. You guys ready for the, the next fly? That, that's all the questions so far. Okay. Well, we're, we're cooking along here. I, um, I don't know. I mean, it seems like we we're supposed to go a lot longer than this, but, uh, but anyway, we're, I guess everybody's going to be home early for dinner. Oh, you're already home. <laughs> um, well, you still have there. 56 people here. Yeah. Now it's now 56. Yeah. yeah. Paul? We had, a, we had a fly that was uh, tied by uh, Chuck Cooney. Yeah, out of uh, Washington County fly fishers. Uh huh. No chunk. Yeah. It had it, it had a grizzly dry, grizzly hackle on the front end. Yeah. With a purple body and olive marabou tail. Uh huh. About the length of that red tail. Yeah. But it was olive. And yeah. That seemed to that seemed to be uh, very attractive to the to the freshly stocked trout. Uh huh. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah. Tell me about the the profile on. He told me about that fly one time, um, and uh, you know, I mean, I think maybe it might work for Chuck because he looks like Santa Claus. And what you know, what uh, what trout would turn down Santa when he's out there, you know, on one of his days off fishing? But um, yeah, that profile is funny, and I I suppose you know it's a mix of a number of things. Uh, you know, what triggers fish, and you know, movement. Uh, uh, but I think more than anything, you know, they always say how do you look at a fly and pick, you know, pick what the fish are going to want to eat? And they, they say, you know, number one is size, then shape, and then color, right? So first of all, if a trout has in its mind, you know, they've, they've keyed into a hatch um, and that hatch happens to be, you know, 21 millimeters big um, and they're, you know, in their little pea brain, a lot like my little pea brain, uh, they recognize that that 21 millimeter imprint on the water, and if it happens to be a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, they may they may not just go, okay, that's something that, that's something that I'm eating right now. So it could be could be the you know the size of the imprint that the fly is on the water. Um, you know, one thing that they say, you know, I remember when the purple haze came out. Um, um, remem remember it very very vividly. Um, the, fly rep from Montana Fly Company came to the fly shop and I'd, we'd never met him before, never heard of Montana Fly Company before. And he comes in with all these boxes of sample flies and he wants to sell me flies for next season. And he, he's just, he's just doling out, doling out free flies right and left, right and left. And he's a cool dude, right? He's really, really nice. And we, we, you know, we, we're establishing this rapport and we're talking about fishing and there's a lot of excitement with it. And, and so it's a, like an early September afternoon and I have all these free flies and, and we decide, let's go fishing. Let's go down to the middle of the chutes and, and fish till dark. So we loaded up in the truck and got out of the shop. And, and I remember tying that purple haze on and never having seen a purple parachute Adams before <laughs> um, and tying it on and just tearing the fish apart with that fly. And, um, you know, time after time after time, the purple haze um, has been one of the best flies ever on all over the place. Deschutes, uh, East Lake, uh, McKinsey, Metolius from time to time, although I prefer purple comparadon on the Metolius for the, for the way it floats with a lower profile. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe Chuck's purple fly, um, you know, purple is, a, is a, a color that the fish really like apparently but the one thing that that i'm told and and um i think you guys were provided from a, a cof um email uh that uh, tim sent out um uh john um uh, uh from the club um did a did a color uh by depth analysis kind of a what what fish see um, and I, I'm pretty sure that uh, at the surface, purple can look an awful lot like olive green to the fish. Um, so are they really seeing it? I mean, we see it as purple, but what, what color do the fish really see it in? So with that, you know, with that in mind, maybe the fish don't even see 
Chuck's purple fly or my purple haze, that's not my fly, but the purple haze that I'm fishing with, um, as an olive fly with a with an olive tail and, and two different shades of olive working together. I don't know, man, just, just a theory. I like to, like to think that I can think like a trout, but really I can only think like a fisherman and, and, uh, and summarize, you know, kind of summarize some guests and who knows, but I dig it. You know, I like, I like the game. We all do. Yeah. Well, it worked for Chuck. He called it an SLP, simple yeah. little purple fly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. So thanks for sharing those uh, memories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing, sharing that too. So, <clears throat> And years ago, um, when I moved moved to Sisters, uh, did somebody else have a question? Nope. Okay. Um, when I moved to Sisters, um, I was uh, very young, uh, 21 years old, um, very, very poor, <laughs> and uh, uh, living in the apartments over on Adams Street, about a block away from the fly shop. Um, and uh, really kind of living the life, um, you know, had, had, uh, um, you know, decided to dedicate my, my life truly to this, uh, business and, and the sport kind of forever. And, um, it allowed me to meet some very, very cool people, um, and fish in a lot of neat places. Um, and one of the people that I met was, uh, a chef from Bend. Um, some of you might know him. He has a catering company now. His name is Ken Clark. And uh, Ken, Ken has a company called Cascade Catering. Uh, he was the uh, chef at, at Hans in downtown Bend when that was a, a going concern, great restaurant. We miss that a lot. Um, and back in the day when, when I first met him, he was my neighbor in those apartments. Um, and uh, he lived next door to me and he had just moved here from New York uh, and was a chef at Blackbeat Ranch or a sous chef. At Blackbeat Ranch, and he he fished a lot. He was he was really dedicated to the fly rod, um, um, and he loved uh, the fact that he got to work at Blackbeat Ranch, which has a very nice trout lake in front of his office there. Um, and so, <clears throat> one one day, Ken comes to me and says, "I got I got to tell you something. I figured out, and this is really crazy, but you know the parachute atoms." No, no, come on, man. Yeah, I know the parachute atoms. He goes, well, okay, so you take your parachute atoms and you take your black Sharpie marker and you take the, uh, I'm gonna go to the other camera here. Do -do -do. Okay, and you take the, uh, the Sharpie marker and you just start coloring that body all black. And uh, he goes, try it. You are not going to believe how much better that works at Black Butte Ranch on the lake out there. And I was like, really? Okay. So I tried it. And in fact, I, I started carrying a, you know, one of these Sharpie markers in my tackle bag um, for that very reason. And, uh, and sometimes we would even you know, darken up the, the wing a little bit. All right. And you can see this, this fly is now transforming into, into something that used to be known as a parachute atoms. And, you know, I really like, um, I really like customers to catch fish. I love having them come back to the, uh, to the shop on fly that, that I chose for him or one of our employees chose for him and hearing that they had success. In fact, I can remember our own Mrs. Steele coming back to the fly shop and saying, I did it, I caught my first fish on the Metolius and it was with a Normwood special and I, <laughs> I picked it out for her. And, uh, and I, I, just, I just, I remember it like it was yesterday even though it was probably 20 years ago. It was. <laughs> Yeah, and um, you know, I, I'm I'm a slow learner, and so one thing um, that that for years and years working in the fly shop every summer during Calabeta season, um, I would tell people about this trick, and then 
you know, because customer service is important, I would offer to, to do it for them. I'll color them for you. Just let me hang on. Let me get my, my Sharpie marker out. So I'd color them. And then at the end of the day, I would come home and you can see my fingertips here are, are black. And every day from about the 15th of May until about the 15th of October, uh, my fingers were covered in, in black Sharpie marker. And about, I don't know, six or seven years ago, I finally got this great idea working with uh, one of our fly suppliers out of Roseburg um, called Dreamcast Flies, uh, Jim Black, one of, the, one of the famous Black brothers that started many of the fly companies are, are, that are well known today. Um, I said, Jim, what's the possibility you could, you could just tie this, this fly for us that, that we call Black Butte Calabatus? It's like, oh yeah, I mean, you know, as long as you order 12 dozen, no problem. Well, I think last year we ordered around 150 dozen of them. Oh and, my gosh. <laughs> and other, other fly shops do as well. Not probably as many as, as we do, um, but it's, it's become kind of a, a neat little bread and butter pattern for us at the fly shop because it, it not only works at Black Butte Lake, but works really, really good up the road at Three Creeks Lake. And from time to time, it works great at Crane Prairie, at Hosmer. I've had a really good success with it at Hosmer. Um, every once in a while, it'll be the key to a, a funny hatch time at East Lake. Um, and it, it's, it's a great fly. And one of the things that, that I like too, this is kind of a neat little story is, um, you know, when you have your own fly and it's in a catalog and, and sold by a company, you get a little royalty. It's not much, you know, I think one year I was able to afford that book off of Amazon from my sales of it. But the last couple of years I've, I've actually, you know, made enough money that I was able to, you know, buy a fly rod at my, at my special cost. And, you know, just from selling a stupid fly that came out of a weird conversation 30 years ago. So um, <laughs> anyway, we call it the, the Black Butte Calabatus uh, in the catalog. It's called Jeff's Black Butte Calabatus. I mean, it's nothing special. I mean, I didn't invent something special here other than it just has kind of a weird funny story to it so it's a great story jeff uh, well, thanks really yeah. like it thanks let me grab a another size 15 hook yeah we got another fly to tie and we got one more fly to tie yep All right, starting with the base of thread. Okay. Um, same well, hook? Yeah, same size 15 uh, uh, 102Y hook. Could also be tied on a standard dry fly hook size 14 to 18. Jeff, do you want to put, on, put a close up? View of, oh, of what yeah, you're doing. Sorry. thanks. Thank thanks you. for telling me to change cameras. Forgot. Yep. Perfect. Good. Okay. Little bit of black Antron yarn here. We're going to cover the thread base here and then come out to about a third of the way back from the eye of the hook. Okay. I don't like that piece of Antron. Had a weird, had a weird uh, kind of melted crinky spot in it and I thought wouldn't, uh, wouldn't flare out very well. So this is just a little bit better here. Okay, so I could just simply uh, uh, tie this in uh, as, one, as one piece and post this, um, but in order for it to uh, float a little bit better, accept a little bit more floatant. Um, what I like to do is actually uh, tie it in kind of right in the right in the middle with a few wraps, bunch them up together, okay, and then start posting around the two pieces. Hey, iPad 2, are you catching this? Yeah, I can see it. Good. <laughs> I'm just teasing because of the name. <laughs> I 
I just want to know who it really is. It's probably that probably that guy from Reddit. <laughs> okay, now you can you can put this uh, hackle in now, or you can come back and, and do it later. I'm just going to do it right now. Um, it, it it can be done at either time. I'm going to do it right now. So I've got my my hackle uh, picked out and sized. I'm going to take the ends and make a make a little removal of the hackle fibers off of the stem. And then right in front of the uh, hook, I'm going to tie that down carefully, bring it up into the uh, wing itself, and then come back and forth up and down my post with three or four wraps. OK, now it's just it's just in there. It's going to be really easy to um, to wrap and, and save a step here after after I get the tail tied in. OK, so come back to the back of the fly. Got my nature spirit dubbing. And again, you could now tie this. You could now tie this in several different colors. But since it's the Black Butte Calabatus that we're tying, we're going to choose the black. All right, we got my, forget which camera, got my uh, dubbing here ready for the fly. The first thing we're, we're gonna do is just make a tiny little ball of dubbing right at the bend of the hook. So we're just gonna dub that, dub that on. You can see that's on there. I'm gonna kind of bunch it together a bit. Okay. And then that's all gonna get put in one very distinct place, making a ball that's going to allow our microfibits um, to to split around those. Okay, and if you've looked at a calabatus uh, spinner or even a calabatus done, um, I suspect that this fly really mostly represents a spinner um, more often than not. But again, hard to know. Um, I'm going to grab a couple of uh, microfibits off of here. Whoops, not drop the said microfibit. Cut those nice and close. We're going to measure measure them for length uh, using the hook shank as a guide. I want them to be right about the same length as the the hook shank itself. Maybe just a slightly longer. Then right up here behind that, that uh, ball of dubbing, you're going to make, make a couple of wraps. And you're going to see that that's starting to kind of naturally split as the thread itself goes up against the ball. So I'm just going to help that along a bit right now by manually taking each tail and giving it a, giving it a nice split, and then continuing my thread tightly up against that ball, okay? Giving me a really easy split tail. And then we're just gonna trim this, get our dubbing. In that uh, time that that thread tightened up, I, that one microfibit kind of got A little funny there, so I just readjusted that. Okay, a little bit of dubbing at a time. Okay, first rapid dubbing, make sure that it gets right up against that, that little ball of dubbing and covers where the tail tie down was. Wrap up to the wing, I'm gonna need a little bit more.
going to come in front of the wing. And then up to the eye of the hook, which will be the tie down point for your hackle. And then wrap your hackle around down the post. I like to get it, you know, five or six good, good turns in there. I like to then pull, hold on to the, the uh, hackle tip and then pull the wing and the hackle fibers that are wrapped parachute style around that wing out of the way. And my fingers are holding that hackle tip in place, allowing me then to take the, the thread and catch that uh, hackle tip. So now I can just trim that without having anything really getting in the way. Got a couple of fibers that got trapped in the in the thread. We can clean that up a little bit more later. And then while that's still bent back, I can re re bend, get it out of the way of the whip finisher. Pop it back into place. Adjust some little things here, and then. <clears throat> I'm going to use I'm going to use my my uh, tips of the scissors as sort of calipers to know the length that I want this wing to be. Okay, so in 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 measuring the length of the hook shank, like so, I can then come up and kind of measure how high up I want that that wing to be trimmed off from the base of the hackle. Um, it's just kind of a good you know you can always do it a little long and then trim it again later. You can't make it. You can't make it longer if you trim it short. So just kind of hold that up into place, pull those pull those tight, and then when it trims, it just kind of fluffs out nice and pretty. And then you can spin it around. There often is usually a hackle fiber or two that are showing a bad hair day. Just trim those off, and that you guys is your black butte. Calabatus. Quite a quite a nice profile, um, and uh, and uh, again, if you're a Three Creeks and Hosmer angler, or you come out and fish the pond at Blackfeet Lake, which is technically for guests and residents of the of the ranch, um, it's a it's a really really good uh, pattern out there, the best as a matter of fact. So, um, or you can or you can end up like like me and have black fingertips and. <laughs> just use your trusty sharpie marker but uh but that works so um anyway any more questions uh there's everybody's happy i don't see any questions okay did we did we keep all 50 something people the whole time we have uh it was as high as 57 yeah and now we have 54 oh uh, that's nice they that's like great. thanks everybody for Sticking with my my bullshit stories and and uh, three flies. Well, how it gets there when uh, fly inventing and history. Yeah. Uh, I've always called you my encyclopedia hmm. <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of information in that brain of yours, and I guess uh, I guess we've known each other now for I don't know, fifteen years. Yeah. Longer. Yeah. And. Uh, I really enjoy picking your brain all the time. Well, thanks. I, I know uh, years and years ago, you and I talked about writing a, a fly tying book, and we still should. But um, I actually started writing a book uh, and uh, have the complete outline done um, and a couple of chapters written, tons of notes. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe by this time next year, we'll have something published. I think the hardest part, it's not so much the writing and the, and the information and then I've got a friend that's an editor that's uh, uh, that really encouraged me to do this. But I think the hardest part is how, how it's going to be illustrated or photographed because um, there's so many ideas that need to be, you know, really shown with either a great great um, you know drawing or or a photograph um, that just can't be put into words. So that's going to be an interesting thing to to accomplish. Well, you tag uh, Todd Moen for that one. Well, I don't think Todd's the guy, but some somebody out there is. I mean, Todd's Todd's skills at videography are are certainly incredible, but I'm not sure about uh, just still photography and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a learning curve. 
Yeah. Um, Buncey would be a good one for illustration. What's that? Richard Buncey Monmouth would be a great one for illustration. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know him very well, but uh, certainly know of him. And you're indeed correct. He's a heck of a good uh, illustrator. Well, we have a good future with uh, this tying uh, this whole group thing, and it's been very successful so far. And uh, you broke the record for the highest number of participants so far. Well, that's nice. That's nice. And <laughs> no, uh, I really, really enjoyed the, the presentation last week on, on lake fishing and, and um, was kind of, you know, I know only, I think only about 30 people or 25 people uh, came to that one and um, was hoping to share that info with, with more and more folks. But, um, you know, I understand it can be sometimes hard to get away in the evenings and, you know, zoom in and, and um, um, but it, it was uh, it was a pleasure to do both of these, and I'm always happy to talk about lake fishing or any kind of fishing, really. But especially, especially the lake stuff. Oh, well, Tricia said, uh, "Love the stories." <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Tricia. Yeah. And uh, next week we have um, Derek Darst. He is the spinning dare hair guy of Oregon. He's incredibly good. And so I'm, we're all looking forward to seeing that. And then uh, after that, we have Peggy Brenner, who's going to be tying the Gray Ghost. So those are the next two that we're going to have uh, online for following weeks. So far, we've been great. None of the instructors have canceled or got sick. So uh, we're, we're on a roll here. <laughs> You know, not, knock on wood, I, I don't know about yeah. all of you guys, but I mean, normally by this time of year, I would at least had a cold, um, if not a couple of colds. And God, I guess just, you know, staying in so much and then wearing the mask and doing all the hand washing. I, I've been healthy as a bear, man. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's been awesome. So I'm, I'm knocking on, knocking on everything <laughs> you can think of to make sure that just didn't jinx me, but um, it's been really nice to not have, I've, I have come and taught classes before at the at the senior center, um, you know, kind of mid cold or late cold, and it's you know stuffy nose. And, uh, but man, this winter's been a dream. Well, I'm going to try to put these videos together so people can access them from our council website. And uh, I got to thank you, Jeff, for I'm, I'm going to embark on uh, Euro nymphing this year. Yeah. So. Jeff's fixed me up with the right hooks and the right materials, and I'm going to go for it and uh, see if I can't tie a bunch of those. And I've uh, got a trip going with uh, one of the guides from the Fly Fisher's Place. We're going to go Euro nymphing for the first time, and I want to learn it. So it should be a lot of fun for us this summer. Yeah, yeah, it will be. It's a lot of fun. It's a great way to catch fish. So you guys take care, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday. All right, you guys. Thank thanks. you. All right. Thank All right. You. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Great to see everybody. Great job. Hope to see Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. Or on the water. That would even be better. <laughs> yeah.